back to the Hunter test prep tutoring that I used. I got a lot of writing skills, a lot of English skills, and then also a lot of math skills that I still use today. A lot of different like approaches that Queller helped me learn. When you went to Hunter, um, what were some of the English classes? Like, do you remember the names of the classes? Just because we want to show the kids what you did for the Hunter exam aligned with high school also. Yeah. So for up until ninth grade, so no, seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th grade are just like pretty standard English classes. So we'd have like maybe five books you'd have to read in a course and then you would have different prompts about the books. You'd have to write about the book. And then after you finished reading the book, you'd have like a culminating essay you'd have to write. And then in 11th and 12th grade, you could choose a different English course per semester instead of one for the whole year. So I decided to take a poetry course my, my first semester of 11th grade. And then I took a Toni Morrison course, who is one of my favorite authors, for the second semester of 11th grade. And then my senior year, I took a short story course. Um, yeah, short story course for my first semester. And then a course on Kafka's Metamorphosis, which was a really interesting book. Ooh, and that's a good really, one. Yeah, we really dove into it. And picked it apart and we had to do a lot of writing. But again, everything that I'd learned five years ago or six years ago now with my Queller Prep tutoring stuck with me. And I really, I would think back to those days in the blue classrooms from eight to 12 <laughs> on weekends. So this is actually super helpful. Do you recall the names of the books that you read in grades seven, eight, nine? Because Kafka's Metamorphosis is actually a great book that is nicely aligned with the prompt for Hunter. So it would be if you could think back to the days of seven, eighth, ninth grade, I'm actually going to write them in the chat box. Yeah, for sure. I think this is, I'm trying to knock my memory here. Um, one was the house on Mango Street. I don't wait, remember. I'm, I'm right, wait, I'm writing it down. The or, house on Mango Street. Can you write it down? I yeah, and I'll add some if he doesn't right. remember. Wait. What do you say, the house on Mango Street? Yeah, the house on Mango Street. So everybody pay attention to these books because today actually we're going to enter a book prompt. So House on Mango Street was one of the books. What yeah. Persepolis? Did we have to read Persepolis? Persepolis, yeah, I think that was eighth grade. Um, there was a picture of Dorian Gray. I think that was the title, right? Something Ooh. Dorian Gray. I mean, oh. yeah, Dorian Gray. I feel like that was an older book, but maybe you're right. Let's just put it in there. Yeah, no, I think that was ninth grade. That was ninth grade. That was ninth grade. I had Mr. Roldy for that, and, I and then Tony Morrison. Grade. What that was already grade nine, ten, eleven, right? Like Tony beloved? Morrison by Tony Morrison. Um, beloved, I think, was like the one you had to read for English class, and then in the Tony Morrison class, we also read The Bluest Eye, Sula. Oh yeah, yeah. all right, one, Sula. The bluest yeah, I forgot eye. what the third was. And um, the there was another one um, where they're in like San Francisco. That was seventh grade. What about their eyes were watching God? Was that one like Zora Neale Hurston? I think that sounds familiar. Uh, not every English class guys um, read the same books as different. Like you just had a list of like 15 different books and the teachers could read or pick like a certain number. Um, I had Mr. Gale in seventh grade and then he left halfway. So I think some of the books that we're supposed to read changed because the new teacher that was filling in had the Metamorphosis is a great book and it's great appropriate, which totally aligns with the prompts. Um, yeah. Before we're going to switch in a moment to talk about the prompts, but can you give the kids just a rough summary of the Metamorphosis? And I'll also give them a summary as well. All right. So it's about this kid, I think. Yeah, a kid. He's in this family. Um, they're in. Europe, I believe. I, this is really, I don't remember it that well at all. Um, but what's like the gist of it? Just because that'll go so nicely. He turns, he kind of like transforms, like is stuck in his room and then he becomes this cock. They don't like specifically say, but I think from the details we get, he becomes like a cockroach. He transforms into a cockroach in his room. It's a really short book. And then... I think it's with like his parents are having to deal with him and like, I think his selfishness. 
part of it. I'm not. Don't quote me on this. That's a great book. I'm going to type the summary of this book just so that everyone has it because basically everyone is really, really nice to the protagonist until he becomes a bug. And then yeah. he basically is useless. And it, it's a really eye-opening novel. So I'm so happy you mentioned that because we were thinking earlier which books to use. So everyone, I'll give you some summaries so you have that. That's a great example. And Antalya has more. As we're shifting gears, Antalya, can you open up uh, what slides you have? And James will help. He's going to basically tell the group what the essay prompt was for Hunter Real Release Test 2 and what we can expect. So James, I'm going to just be on mute a little bit, but basically mm -hmm. if you can look at what Tell the students what they need to know. And if you could show the prompt on the screen, Antalya, that would be great. Yeah, sorry, I'm doing it now. Also, James, for the prompt. I'm also going to type can... summaries into the chat box so that we have them. Sorry, James, for the prompt, maybe we can work on thinking through outline, like a general outline for this kind of prompt. Mm -hmm. And then we can go over um, the specific examples that I, that we have in the, in the yeah. PDF. Sorry, doing too many things. <laughs> Sorry, it's still going, guys. <clears throat> All right. So this up here is the prompt. Can you see it okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. So think, this is the prompt. Think about a time you learned something from a book that you were able to apply to your life outside of school. Then write an essay or a real life story in which you describe your experience learning that specific important idea from a book and how you applied that idea to your own life. Make sure to use vivid language and detail throughout your essay or real life story and to include why this idea was important. All right. So I think the first thing I took from this prompt was that's not good. Sorry. The first thing I took from this prompt was that it's kind of giving you an option to write either an essay or real life story. Um, you might be wondering what's the difference? Well, a real life story would just be something that you've experienced and it would be like a direct takeaway. Whereas an essay, you're kind of applying the idea from the book that you're writing about to a greater thesis almost. And then, sorry, is that a question? Oh, okay. I'm uh oh in the chat. No, 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 someone sent me a chat. Um, gotcha. All right, so how I'd approach this, I would say with your outline, you'd want an introduction, two or three body paragraphs. This, this is if you're writing the essay, intro two or three body paragraphs, and then a conclusion. And as we can note in the prompt itself, it asks us to use vivid language to describe, which is where things like metaphors and similes come in. Um, as I was saying earlier, you really want the reader or of like the, the grader of the essay to be there with you when you're describing the experience that you had after reading this book. So for the intro, we'd probably want to like show what the essay is going to be about without like specifically having the topic sentences of each essay. That's really important. You kind of want to give them an outline or a map to what your essay is about, but you don't want to give them too much because you want them to be so interested that they keep reading. In order to start the intro, you want to hook something that really grabs them. You can ask something like a rhetorical question or have a really vivid piece of imagery in your intro. Um, for the body paragraphs, we want to start with a topic sentence. And then after the topic sentence, you want to transition. If you're writing this essay about, say, Harry Potter, you want to transition into said experience and provide not like evidence per se, since this is your own experience, but you want to provide the lesson. And then after you do that, you want to explain that. So that's kind of the analysis of the evidence that you used. And then for the conclusion, you kind of want to wrap up the essay without repeating it. So you want to have a main takeaway or your main idea overall from the essay without just saying, my essay said this. Um, you can don't start your conclusion with basic lines like in conclusion or 
finally you want to kind of ease the reader into it without blatantly saying that you're at the concluding paragraph. And okay. then after this, we'll go back to some examples. Keep in mind those books that I said are in the Hunter curriculum, if you are thinking about reading something to write about. I just wanted to add some stuff, especially mm -hmm. for um, a prompt like this, when they're asking you about a book, don't forget to write the title of the book in your intro, right? What book are you talking about? Write the title. And titles usually go in, are they underlined usually? I think books are underlined, the titles. But if it's yeah. a short story, it's like a quotation mark. Yeah. So you have to underline a book. Okay, so like Harry Potter, make sure that's underlined. I actually think I messed that up in the examples, but we can fix that. Um, and write the author, okay? You want to know, you want the people reading it to know who's actually writing this book that you're talking about. Um, and definitely, like James mentioned, you want the lesson in there and then maybe an outline of how it applies to your life. Okay. Um, okay. All righty. Um, and then in these next examples that come up, the way that they're generally structured is, um, let's see here, one of the body paragraphs um, has like a context or what the book is about, okay? And then the other two um, will have like the, how it manifests in your life, okay? There are different ways that you can do it, but these are just how the examples have them. Okay, so something to keep in mind. All right, and then James will take it away with this example. Um, I didn't fully insert, like where it says insert examples, maybe we can like elaborate and stuff as we go mm -hmm. through it. All right, so this is an example using Harry Potter. In the dim glow of my bedside lamp, I embarked on a journey into the enchanting world of Harry Potter, XYZ for whatever Harry Potter, Harry Potter title this is. Notice here how we start with the hook. You start with a really vivid piece of imagery that brings the reader directly into your piece. Little did I know that within the magical corridors of Hogwarts, again, with the vivid imagery, magical corridors, I really feel like I'm walking through this ancient building. I would uncover lessons that transcended, that's a good word, transcended the boundaries of fiction and etched themselves onto the canvas of my reality. We're really sticking with this vivid imagery here as this is like the best way to show the reader that you know what you're talking about. The pivotal idea that would leave an indelible mark on my life was the power of friendship and the unwavering strength derived from the standing united against adversity. So here, we really have the, the map to what your essay is going to be about. You state what your idea or what your takeaway from this book was. The indelible mark that was power of friendship and unwavering strength when you unite against adversity, as Harry did with Hermione and the, the redhead. I forgot his name. Ron, Ron. The unbreakable trio of Harry, Ron, and Hermione emerged not merely as characters in a fantastical tale, but as companions on a shared quest for courage loyalty and resilience. So that's the topic sentence of this first body paragraph. Insert example from book. So, okay. So an example when Harry Potter could be when they, the in the final book, they have like the, or I think the first part of the final book, because the final book is broken up into seven and eight, but they fight against Voldemort and like they have the big fight with Hogwarts. And that's when they really, the three of them come together after hardships that they faced as a friend group because Harry was going behind Ron's back, Ron was going behind Harry's back. But yeah, you would talk about that. You didn't put the example there. And then the next sentence is going to be the analysis. The camaraderie they shared in reference to the example you used became a beacon of inspiration, beckoning me to reflect on the importance of genuine connections beyond the realm of magic and mythical creatures. So here we relate this example back to our lives because again, this story is asking for the lesson that you took away from the example. You don't just wanna say it. I was able to forge such powerful connections earlier this year 
when I noticed that a new student had joined our sixth grade class. So this is the topic sentence for the next body paragraph. You're directly relating the example from the book to your personal life. So then here you're going to include the example of how you stood up for the student that had just joined your sixth grade class, reflecting the same ideas that were you talked about in the previous body paragraph in this final version of Harry Potter. Similar to the trials and tribulations that Harry, Ron, and Hermione trio confronted, we navigated a difficult situation together. So here you directly tie your experience to the book. In like the same sentence, you reference the book. We navigated a difficult situation together. We sought help for the student and stood up for what we believed was right. So you're using we here so the reader always knows that you're talking about yourself. Ultimately, the strength among us provided the confidence to make a positive difference in someone's life. So here you're kind of patting yourself on the shoulder. You're saying that something you did had a direct impact, positive impact on someone's life. That's important because, again, this essay wants to paint you in a good light and you need the, the test graders to want you at Hunter. The power of friendship and unity applies to my time playing soccer on a club team as well. So here using a different example, you don't want this whole essay to have one example. I mean, the books, there's eight different Harry Potter books, so you can include more than just one example about yourself. Insert example about practicing drills. So you're learning how to pass and you're learning how to be a team player, but you also have to still be a good friend off the field. Together with my friends, we tackled each obstacle, drawing strength from our shared history and belief that much like the characters we admired in reference to Harry, Hermione, and Ron, we could overcome anything with unity and determination. Much like, uh, yeah, these trials were not as fantastical as battling dark wizards, but they were real and formidable nonetheless. So here you're using a personal anecdote relating the time you've had on the soccer field with your friends to the battling dark wizards that Harry, Ron, and Hermione had. You're connecting it back to the book. As depicted in Harry Potter, the magic of friendship is not confined to the fictional realm. So this is a perfect topic sentence for your conclusion. It's a wrap up of what you kind of just talked about, but also relating it back to the book in case people, in case the grader while reading forgot the main idea of what Harry Potter was. The magic of friendship is not confined to the fictional realm. It is a universal in nature. It's a timeless truth that extends its tendrils into the tapestry of our everyday lives, everyday lives whether it be in a middle school cafeteria or on the soccer field. So here you're talking about the two different examples that you included in the body paragraphs, both when you helped the new sixth grader and when you were on the soccer field with your friends. The camaraderie, loyalty, and shared resilience portrayed in the book became a blueprint for navigating challenges and is now an integral part of my personal narrative, for which I'm very grateful for. So here, this is kind of the final sentence. You're wrapping everything up and you're connecting your personal experiences with Harry Potter for one last time with a direct correlation between the idea from the book and your personal life. Um, just have a lot of chat questions here. I'm gonna tackle quickly. How many pieces of evidence should we have per paragraph? I think each body paragraph should have one example. If you are gonna write something like this, here we have the one example about the new sixth grader and then you have an analysis and then the next body paragraph has the example of playing soccer with your friends and then you have analysis. If you have more than one example per body paragraph, it might get a little bit busy and the reader could get lost. Yeah. If you check the chat box, I'm just literally sending over summaries and lessons from the books that we know are used at Hunter and these are just easy to talk about and summarize. And this is a great way for you to go into the test prepared so that you know for sure that you have a book you're definitely gonna write about if you're asked with this type of question. Um, Antal, you can keep going. I'm literally just gonna copy and paste summaries. Sure. Doesn't um, necessarily, go. Oh, sorry. No, go, go. So someone asked the question, does it give you extra points if your book is more famous or fancy such as classics? I don't think so. I think as long as you get your point across, it'll be much as appreciated if you're using a book that has sold 100 copies as a book that is a world's bestseller. I think it's really about how you present it and how you tell your story rather than how the book told its story. But you do want to include a good idea. You don't want to say, I read a book and the main idea was that pizza is the best food and that really resonated with me because I'm from New York and I love pizza. That's not what you want to do. All right. 
the floor is yours, Antalya. All right, good. Yeah, James did a great job going through this. Um, I'm going to add some stuff uh, here for the Harry Potter XYZ. Um, I didn't read Harry Potter, which is why <laughs> it looks like this. But anyway, um, you have to put the author name, like I said before, right? So by J.K. Rowling. Okay, so don't forget that. And I just wanted to highlight a few places where there are some good transition words that you um, should be using throughout your essays. Um, to, 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 let's see. Um, I think I had somewhere like similar to the trials and tribulations that Harry, Ron, and Hermione trio confronted. Then there's ultimately, in this last sentence, right? Ultimately, the strength among us provided the confidence to make a positive difference. And then when you're introducing a new idea in the topic sentence here, um, you're using the words as well, okay? And, you know, when you're writing these essays, you should really try um, to have good transitions between the paragraphs. So, like, for example, between one paragraph, no, sorry, body paragraph one and body paragraph two, um, there's a very clear transition, right? It goes from talking about the importance of genuine connections. And then literally in the next sentence, you go, I was able to forge such powerful connections, right? So sometimes mentioning the same word in a little bit of a different way can help the essay flow a little better so that it's not like you're just jumping to a completely different topic. And that's what the words as well do too in the third body paragraph, right? It's adding to an idea that came before. Um, and let's see, what other transitions did we have? Um, I think that's pretty much it for this, but <laughs> on the Hunter rubric, they do want you to have more transitions than the ones here. So definitely just something to keep in mind, like words like however, when you're introducing an idea, although, um, and we can go over some of those later. Um, but overall, this is like a good structure. Okay. Um, are we ready to go on to the next essay, James? All right. Okay. Nice, yeah, let's go. All right. Um, so this next essay is a little more creative in terms of the example outline um, we were talking about. So I'm just going to kind of, there's a lot more paragraphs. And so I just want to show you guys that you can do it a little differently. Um, but essentially the way this is working is that these two paragraphs are talking about the book. Um, and these ones are more talking about the reader, okay? And on the real exam, like you're gonna have to condense it definitely, um, but just to give you an idea of that descriptive language and the kinds of examples that would be appropriate. So James, take it away. And if you notice any transition words or anything, please point them out. I'll try to highlight them too. All right. In the small library of my childhood, where each shelf whispered tales of adventure and wisdom, once again with the vivid language, I stumbled upon Lois Lowry's The Giver. Little did I know within its pages, I would unearth a profound lesson that would shape my understanding of individuality and the power of choice. So this is a great intro paragraph as it highlights both what you're going to be talking about in the essay and the idea that you want to focus on from the book. The narrative unfolds in a dystopian society where the suppression of human emotions and memories is carefully concealed. As I delved into the world of Jonas, the protagonist, I became ac acutely aware of the significance of free will and self-expression. The community, community depicted in The Giver had eliminated the burden of choice, shielding its inhabitants from the complexities of life. In this controlled environment, emotions are subdued, memories erased, and individually sacrificed for the collective harmony. It was a world devoid of pain, but also one robbed of the vibrancy that arises from the kaleidoscope of human experiences. So this paragraph is outlining the book, but not only outlining the book, it also makes sure to connect the book to yourself. While this, the following two paragraphs are more about the reader, you still wanna connect the paragraphs about the book to yourself. The pivotal moment, so that's a good, um, transition word. The pivotal moment in the story occurs when Jonas is assigned the role of the receiver of memories. In this prestigious 
position, he inherits the memories of the past, both beautiful and painful. The weight of his responsibility thrust upon Jonas reveals the profound truth that choices, even difficult ones, are an integral part of what makes us human. The novel imparts the idea that without the ability to make choices, life loses its essence, becoming a mere existence rather than a journey. So this is kind of the wrap up for the summary of the book. And now we're going to move into the reader part or where you connect the lesson from the giver to yourself in your everyday life. The lesson from the giver resonated deeply with me and became a guiding force in my own life. So that's the topic sentence. As an almost teenager facing the crossroads of identity and self-discovery, the notion of embracing my individuality and the freedom to make choices carried profound significance. This is really connecting the book to yourself. The realization that life's richness lies in its diverse experiences, both joyful and challenging, was a revelation that spurred me to leave what I know behind. So this is a perfect kind of ending sentence to this body paragraph and starting with the next body paragraph as it sets you up for your next topic sentence it kind of says here's what i learned and then stops and then now in the next body paragraph you're going to include that example i vividly remember a particular instance when this lesson manifested in my life as i confronted the the decision of pursuing professional gymnastics so now you're going to talk about this example you're going to say how you did something with gymnastics and know that you're going to have to connect it to the giver. While reflecting, I found solace and inspiration in Jonas's journey. The fear of making the wrong choice lingered, but the giver taught me that the fear of making choices should not cripple one's ability to embrace the unknown. It has empowered me to trust my instincts, acknowledging that mistakes were not failures, but stepping stones towards growth. This is a perfect way of connecting what you talk about in the first two paragraphs to the example you just provided. And it says how what you learned in the book, while really abstract, can still be applied to your everyday life with a more like specific example. I chose to focus on my academics, opting to designate gymnastics as an important hobby of mine. So this is the distinction of you have to make choices without fearing what those choices lead to. Making this decision was fraught with uncertainty, but the ability to choose my path filled each step with a sense of purpose. I discovered the profound truth that every decision, no matter how trivial, shapes the narr narrative of one's life. Using the narrative of one's life kind of connects your lesson back to the book, as in the book, the giver is read is told by a narrator. So you have the narrative of your life and the narrator of the giver. So you're connecting your life back to the book. In applying the lesson from the giver, I learned that the tapestry of life gains its beauty from the varied threads of choices we weave into it. So the, I think tapestry was used in the first or second paragraph. So you're kind of bringing that vocabulary back to the concluding paragraph. The courage to embrace individuality and the power of choice have not only enriched my personal journey, but have also become guiding principles. Lois Lowry's masterpiece continues to echo in the corridors of my mind. So here we're kind of wrapping it up with the really same vivid imagery that we had in the first paragraph a timeless reminder of the importance of embracing the freedom to choose for it is those choices that the true essence of life unfolds and then ending it with a piece of vivid imagery again, the unfolding of life. Yeah, I think we can go through and highlight some more um, transition words as well as good vocabulary to use. But I think the big theme of this was the use of vivid imagery. I think, like the Harry Potter essay, and like the prompt itself asked you for, it's important to include that as without it, your essay is kind of just you talking at the narrator rather than telling the story. Um, I think making the, the decision was fraught with uncertainty. That's a really good sentence as it kind of shows that you're aware of the impact that these decisions you have to make have without kind of just saying, I didn't know which one to choose it provides vivid imagery even in the place where you don't need it. And applying lesson ever. I think as an almost teenager facing the crossroads of identity and self-discovery, this was a crossroads was a good choice rather than saying as an almost teenager deciding between or facing identity and self-discovery, crossroads kind of mends both of those words together.
without having you state like the obvious the realization i think a lot of this essay has like a duality where you're comparing two different things kind of like what the essay prompt asks you to do compare your life to the book but the realization that life's richness lies in its diverse experiences joyful and challenging the previous sentence of identity and self-discovery or the pivotal moment of facing academics versus gymnastics kind of echoes the relationship between the book that you're describing as well as your personal life. So it's all very twofold. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add to, thank you, James, um, for this, like I said, it's like five body paragraphs. You don't have to do that, right? For your book, you can remember how we said you can do two to three body paragraphs one of those body paragraphs can just be about the book. So, you know, you can condense all of this. And I think The Giver Two is like a pretty complicated book to write about how you relate to it. So um, I don't know that I would necessarily expect you as like a sixth grader to come up with all this, um, but having like um, a more complex train of thought for your age is what they really like. And so as long as you're like aiming for that, that's pretty good. And then... I think it's better to spend a little bit more time on, you know, really talking about why gymnastics was so important to you and why you had to choose between a professional career and like going to school. And that's like a good thing because it shows that you have a hobby and that you are dedicated to it. Um, and again, that's something that you can market yourself with. So general structure is good. Um, and then I wanted to say too, this essay really um, repeats a lot of words, like the word profound, like three times. I personally am not a huge fan of repeating the same words over and over again. Either find a different, like unless it shows something, like if you repeat it in the conclusion, but if you're using like the same adjectives, either pick something different or don't use that adjective. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else for this, James? No, but I think the thing that you said really resonated with me you want this essay to be more than just the prompt itself you really want to show like all these different sides to you you're a multifaceted person and your essay this one is really unconventional which I kind of like it shows that you can think outside the box and the use of all these different stories within your life like provide so much more to your story rather than just oh they can take a math part of a test they can answer some English questions and then respond to a prompt we give them. You really want to fill it in because the test is all that Hunter has to base your admissions off of. It's not like the college process where you submit so many different things. You really just have this one test and you want to use the essay to show parts of yourself that the English section and the math section don't reflect. All right, cool. All right, so we have one more example that we're going to work through. Um, this one, I think, is more conventional essay-wise. And again, it has to do with the theme of friendship. So for all of you out there, I think that's a very, I guess, that's a safe thing to have if you know a book that you really like that talks about friendship. I think you can really expand on that, but that's just definitely a common theme. Um, this one uses more examples, and so... We'll let James take it away. <laughs> All right. In the enchanted world of my childhood, where the magic of literature painted the walls and of my imagination, E.B. White's Charlotte's Web is a heartwarming narrative about Wilbur, a naive pig, and Charlotte, a wise and compassionate spider. So once again here, we have a hook that directly has a lot of vivid imagery for the reader. The silken threads of this whimsical story contain essential lessons for young readers, but also, but really stands as a testament to the transformative power of friendship and the inevitability of loss. So here you're kind of having that map of what your essay is going to be about. You're going to talk about friendship and loss of friendship. The crew of Charlotte's Web lies in Charlotte's selfless act of weaving words into her web to save Wilbur from his death. So here you're going to provide an example from the book. You want to explain it in detail because if you just say she wrote, you're going to die. That's not, that doesn't like allow you to expand on it. So you have to go into detail with this one. The poignant message embedded in this act of kindness for a friend transcends the boundaries of fiction, resonating deeply within the chambers of my own heart. So here you're connecting your personal life and your emotions 
to the story without having going into like deep detail. The profound wisdom of Charlotte's Web came to life in my own story when I moved to a new city. Although I was a stranger, my friend Ben took me under, uh, okay, not Ben. <laughs> um, let's yeah. do Antalya. My friend Antalya took me under her wing and showed me the ropes of Hunter Middle School. She did not care that others looked at me with a peculiar realm of pop, uh, sorry, with a peculiar. I meant expression. Oops, typos. Uh, with expression. an expression because I was unfamiliar face. She did not mind that I could not offer her much in the realm of popularity. However, she was always there to laugh with during recess and to complete homework with after school. A dear friend, much like Charlotte, became a source of solace and guidance during a turbulent time. Her unwavering support and the empathy she wove into the fabric of our friendship. So this is kind of direct reference to the book where the spider wove words into the web. Into the fabric of our friendship mirrored the profound connection between Wilbur and Charlotte. The lesson I gleaned from the book that true friendship requires selflessness and sacrifice became a guiding principle of mine. With time, I learned, so that's a good transition word. With time, I learned some information that required me to practice the selflessness and sacrifice my friend had taught me so well. And Talia became sick. I had to move in with her grandparents in a different city. To She had to move in with her grandparents in a different city to get special treatment. I found that friendship has inevitable moments of sadness and like the changing of seasons, so that's the descriptive language, undergoes transformation. Every friendship, no matter how genuine, is susceptible to the inevitable, inevitable march of time. The departure of my friend, akin to Charlotte's inevitable fate, casts a shadow of melancholy over our shared memories. It was in this moment of loss that I realized the enduring impact of the lessons from Charlotte's Web. So here you're really connecting your personal experience to the book, whereas the previous paragraph was more of an overall connection. The idea of facing loss with grace and cherishing the memories of those who have touched our lives resonated profoundly. So here you're going to provide letter, examples of how you coped, you sent letters, you FaceTimed, you visited in order to pay back everything that Antalya provided for you when you guys were friends at the same school. In the pages of a beloved childhood book, I discovered the strength to embrace the transient nature of relationships, acknowledging that the beauty of friendship lies not only in its duration, but in the indelible mark it leaves on the tapestry of our lives. In essence, Charlotte's Web, so that's a good concluding thing. Rather than saying in conclusion, you say in essence. It shows that you have edge to you. Charlotte's Web illuminated the path towards a deeper understanding of the human experience, offering solace in moments of loss and celebrating the beauty inherent in the delicate threads of friendship. So once again, we're kind of continuing with a spider web theme here, the delicate threads. Through the lens of the cherished tale, I discover that even in the face of inevitable goodbyes, the echoes of genuine connection persist, forever etched in the recess, recesses of the heart. All right. I think this essay includes the most like tying back to the book of all the essay, other essays that we read. It's kind of told in like a language that Charlotte's Web would be told in with all this reference to making a web or yeah, the threads of friendship. I'm sorry to put you on the spot with my friend getting sick. I didn't realize that would happen to the friend in this essay. No, this was not real. I was just, I was just making it up as I was going, but I think, yeah. you know, I was just thinking about a possible loss that could happen that would, yeah. disc that would be similar to Charlotte's web, which I also forgot exactly what happens, but that's why you would have that example in the beginning to let mm -hmm. the reader know. <laughs> but I just want to remind everyone listening, if you don't know it, you could make it up. So that's perfectly fine, too. Yeah. We're not taking a polygraph during this test. All right. So you can elaborate on that also. It's perfectly fine to make it up as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. If you have an example in a book that you really liked, but nothing in your life directly tied to that, you can make it up. Make sure it's believable. You don't want to sound like you're coming from another planet, but no one like... Um, Miss Francis said, no one's having like giving you a lie detector test. As long as it's believable and you can spin it into a really good story, then it's fair game. Um, in this story, I really liked all of the connection again, like I said before, all of the connection back to the book. And I think the use of three body paragraphs here, or no, four body paragraphs rather than the two of the first one and then like the unorthodox version of the second 
I think it provides a really strong basis and you like it strengthens the connection that you provide between yourself and the book. I think also good overall vocabulary. So unwavering support um, in essence, the crew of Charlotte's web, I think you have to make sure that you use like an advanced vocabulary, but then again, here, there's no like unnecessary words. You're not using big words just for the sake of using big words. They all make sense when you do use them. I think one of the most embarrassing things would be to use a really fancy word in a place where it makes no sense. That shows a lot worse than just using the more basic form of that word. So it's better to be safe than sorry, but if you can swing, uh, like better vocabulary, you should definitely go for it. Um, no contractions, which is really important. You have to make sure when you're writing, you don't forget that you don't want to use words like can't or shouldn't. And then also you don't start sentences with words like and or because or to. Um, this essay has that as well. And then I think the intro does a really good job of providing a hook while also having a map, just like the conclusion kind of has a map to what you just talked about while also having a good hook transition word of in essence. And then you also, I think here it quotes the title, but like Antalya said in the beginning, we want to use underlines for the titles of books. Make sure you remember that. And then E.B. White's. So here we included the author's name without saying by said author, which is a good way to switch it up, especially if everyone else is writing Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. And then again, the large use of examples from the book, it shows that you really have, or like examples from the book and then also relating it to your life, it shows that you are a multifaceted person. You've had all these different experiences. You talk about not only how when you first met your friend, she helped you a lot getting through school, but then you noticed that she had to leave and go with her grandparents, but you didn't let that stop you from being her friend. You still went out of your way to make her feel comfortable and repay all the respects that she gave you when you first transferred to your new middle school. All righty. I think, I think that was pretty good. Thanks, James. We still have some time before you have to head out. I guess I just wanted to ask, did you read The Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank? I did not, no. Okay, I didn't either. Um, we Why in our like last few minutes before we move on to the next stuff, do you have like any good books that you read as like a middle schooler that maybe we can like brainstorm like an outline to just so everyone can see? I'll think of one too. So I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but yeah, I'm going to give it a thumb. I'm gonna start, I, there's probably so many that I read that I just don't remember the title to. I'm going to look yeah. at just like middle books for middle schoolers. Mm. I'm sure like Matilda people. like James and the Giant Peach okay yeah yeah Those. I don't remember if I read To Kill a Mockingbird at Hunter before it might have been, I think it was at Hunter I think that's part of yeah oh Holes I remember Holes where the kid had to like is I remember that was a movie I watched the movie before I read the book I'm not gonna lie but okay. he was he stole a pair of shoes and then he got put in like a correctional facility and they made him dig holes. And then it turned out that he found his like great grandfather's fortune or something. While I don't think that will directly correlate to any of your guys' lives. I think a lesson we could take from that again, in line with the, the first essay and the last essay we read are the importance of making friendships. I think he makes a lot of lasting friendships with people he wouldn't, have made friendships with before he makes friendships with like adults who are also in prison um again i don't think that, that applies to any of you guys but you could spin it into a way how like you should give everyone a chance regardless of like don't judge a book by its cover kind of you see these grown men in prison you're like oh i'm not going to become friends with them but then i think stanley the character's name the protagonist's name he gives them a chance and realizes that they're great people and forms lifelong friendships. And you can talk about that in your essay saying, one time I gave this kid who people were bullying at school a chance and realized that they were really great. And now they're my lifelong best friend. And I can't wait to do all this fun stuff with them. And I had done all this fun stuff with them. 
Um, that's I think friendship is definitely a good theme because it shows that you are a caring person rather than just writing about sometime you learn something. Well, that was great not to knock if you're going to write about something that you've learned, but what's another book? When I search it up, all these books are new books. They're not like classics. Yeah, I was looking up polls and it came out in 2003. Yeah. Like, um, let me think of one after I put you on the spot. Um, we could do Matilda, honestly. Have people read Matilda? I hope you I think we're giving away how old I am. House on Mango Street. I don't remember House on Mango Street. Um, Lord of the Rings, I did not read. Someone said Percy Jackson, mm. like the lightning thief. I don't remember. Does anyone have a lesson from the lightning? Oh, someone said Matilda. Okay, let's do Matilda. Okay. So intro, you want to mention for sure that it's Matilda by Roald Dahl, however you say his name. Um, and people in the chat who said they read Matilda, um, what's, what's a lesson that you may have learned? I have one off the top of my head, but I just want to see for those of you in the chat who said you read Matilda. Okay, well, I'll throw it out there so we're not wasting time, right? I think Matilda is a lot about reaching your potential um, and, like, maximizing intellectual curiosity, right? She's super curious and, you know, figures out how to do all these things with her mind, um someone wrote there's a lot of parent negligence okay <laughs> that's important because you do not want to mention negative things about these books you want positive messages yeah. that um you can bring your own examples into right so if you're talking about like reaching your potential and intellectual curiosity um first in the first body paragraph you would talk about how Matilda shows this, right? Give the context for the book. And then you would talk about maybe, um, let's, let's switch it up. Let's do intellectual curiosity first and then reaching your potential. You can talk about how um, you go to the museum and you love like, I don't know, learning about fossils. You go to the American Museum of Natural History and you learn about fossils with your parent or some scientific thing. And then you can say like, you took this interest to the next level and you um, presented a science fair project and you won or something. And it was related to what you saw at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, but all through this, you're gonna weave in those lessons from Matilda, right? Like how, she rose up against all odds and she someone believed in her oh you could also talk about like a teacher who had an impact on you right one of matilda's teachers is like miss honey or something she believed in her and gave her things to read and that's how she excelled so you can talk about like how you reach your potential with the fifth or fourth grade teacher that you had or something so your job when you go home is to think about like books that you really like and what you can learn from them. Um, yeah, someone asked me if you make it up in reference to the essay. So if you make up your example and then you get in, will they punish you if, you, if they find out that you made up your example? They will not punish you. I don't think the admissions um, office will care too much because, I mean, you still had the creativity in your mind to write such a good story that they believed it. So, And then a lot of the people that grade your essays are teachers, so... I think you might run into some people that you saw practicing the exam when you go to the school. Yeah. Also, just the only thing you can't make up is the examples from the book because yeah. chances are they probably read that and you know you don't want to say something that's not true. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like James said, make sure your example, if you're gonna make it up, just make sure they're realistic. 
Okay, someone asked a good question. If these essays are written by the tutors, how realistic would it be that a sixth grader could write these essays? I think that's a good question. You should, these are just examples of thing you should, things you should strive towards, like James was saying with the transition words, the descriptive imagery, and just follow the outline, right? One body paragraph about the book, one body paragraph about how you show something in the book, and then another body paragraph about how you show something else in the book, okay? Someone asked about the tortoise and the hare being a good book. Um, I don't really know. I feel like, I feel like it should be a higher level book. Is a tortoise yeah. and like a children's book? Yeah, right. I didn't even. I thought it was just like a like a story within. Oh, like, I don't know. Is it like? Is I don't know if it's a book. I've never. Like, I got told it by my parents when I was young. But again, yeah, you want like a more like life changing kind of type story, like it made you rethink how you thought about everything. Okay, and then someone said, would you be allowed to use a book that has very light bad words that aren't really considered bad words? Um, as long as you're not using them in the essay, that's fine. I don't think anyone would know about, about what kind of language exactly is used in a particular book, okay? And then someone asked, is Animal Farm by George Orwell good for this? Yeah, if you understand Animal Farm and you can write about it, go ahead. That's a good one. I'm sure they'll be very impressed <laughs> by the fact they use Animal Farm. Okay, someone said Secret Garden. Yep, should work. The Giver. Yep, that's a good one. Um, Aesop's Fables, I think, right? I think it should be fine. As long as you have like a higher level thinking about it. Huck Finn is good. Yep. I think we have to read Huck Finn in Hunter too. Yeah, so. that sounds good. All right. Any any other words of advice? I mean, we could, how long can you stay, James? There's other stuff that we can work through too, but I just don't know. When you have to leave. I can probably do one or two more examples or like things. I'd probably like five more minutes. Um, before like I five more minutes? Jump. Um, yeah. Why don't we like brainstorm another book outline? Because the other thing would just take a long time. Um, anything else that comes to mind? Um, Narnia. I don't, oh, what, oh that's Disney good. Video or Narnia. Either one of those. I, I forgot what already. happens in the bridge to Arabithia except for the sad ending. Do you remember? Or like, is there a good no. lesson from that? All I remember is the the sad ending with like the the girl. Okay, yeah, um, me too. Um, what about the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe? That's like the the one. Um, His magnificent future history of the universe. Did you read I don't that? Know that book by Robert A. Heinlein? No, it doesn't ring a bell. If you like it and you have a good lesson from it, that's fine. Okay, let me think of what book. Uh, yeah, I think as long as the example you choose to relate to your life is an advanced example, then it's like it's good to go. Um, the book itself doesn't matter. Like it doesn't have to be a world-renowned book, as long as the example that you're using is good. What if I don't remember all of the quotes you from a book? Um, I don't think that you have to do direct quotes. They're not asking that much of you. You just want to get the example that you're going to use like spot on. You don't want to mess up the details too much. But you don't need to have like anything in quotation marks. They're definitely, they don't want you to like cite page numbers or anything. Yeah. And like we were saying, common themes, friendship, the giving tree, generosity, um, reaching your potential, working with other people. Someone asked if several kids write about the same book, do they compare the essays to each other? I don't think so. So I think different people probably read the essay. So just write like a descriptive essay that shows that you can reflect and you're aware of, excuse me, who you are and what you're doing. Yeah. If right. the book is part of a series, how do I know which one to choose? If it's like a overarching theme amongst the series, kind of like the Harry Potter one that we had in the first essay. I think you can focus on that. But also if it's like a particular event in a certain book, then you can focus on just that. So it's up to you if you want to tackle a whole series of books like Harry Potter, or if you want to be in the fifth book of Harry Potter series. The Duckling yes. Gets a Cookie. Not familiar with that book. Um, if it has a good lesson, then... 
Go if it's it. like if you give a mouse a cookie though like i hope <laughs> i think they yeah. would know that <laughs> like yeah choose a higher level book <laughs> yeah like yeah. things yeah 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 like okay. with the the tortoise and the hare example exactly yeah project hail mary Not okay sure. and someone asked is asking if this is the essay writing portion of the hunter exam yes it is when talking about the book should you use direct quotes that you remember or paraphrase if you remember some that's great but if not we're all paraphrasing here, right? Like when we're talking about these books. So that's okay too. And remember, you're not going to have a lot of space to write all of this. I think for the writing section, correct me if I'm wrong, James, um, you want to finish at the end of whatever line they provide you because yeah. I heard in my time, they stop reading after that yeah. line. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I but think that's something they told us to. Safe than sorry. Yeah, I think it's two pages front back if i remember correctly yeah that and that was and we'll go over there have been some changes since then but we'll go over just this particular essay what the prompt was and yeah. so like, can you also write what the instructions are i have that as well i just want everyone to have a clear picture of the instructions so i had sent that to you earlier but let's rewrite so they all remember what the instructions are as well um, for which one? For the for the for essay like prompt. So I I have that information. But basically, things that you need to know. Um, for example, number one, you shouldn't detach the writing assignment from the test booklet. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't need to include a title. Can we just let's just outline everything? I messaged it to you earlier as well. Um, is it in this chat or is yeah? It it's it's in the text that I sent to you earlier. Okay. Sure. I'll resend yeah, we'll it. Yeah, can you just resend it and then we'll go yeah, over I'm doing it. it right now okay thank you i just want to go over what the rules are with this particular essay prompt sorry did you email it or did you I just sent it to you um, as a text message to your phone. I could read it out. I actually, James, oh, no, it's okay. I, got it. I, I just it. sent it. James, you have it, right? So let's just go over. I just want everyone to be um, understanding what the instructions are for the prompt. Okay. All right. So do you have it, Antalya, or should I go? Yeah, over? I have it, but should I just read it out? Yeah, yeah. Let, let James do it. So this way you could write, okay. he'll read. Sure. Okay. All right. So instructions. Complete the writing assignment on the lined paper on page 18. If necessary, you may continue on to page 19. Only pages 18 and 19 will be read by the evaluators. So it seems like they're still going with that. Do not detach the writing assignment from the test booklet. So if it is like a bunch of pages stapled, you don't want to rip the test booklet, uh, the, the writing assignment out, even if it is easier to write for you. You want to keep it in with all the other pages. You do not need to include a title. So don't worry about that. You may use a pen or pencil. Make sure your exam booklet number and admissions code ID are written clearly. So I'm assuming that it's gonna, they're going to give you a space at the top of the essay in case the pages do fall out. So before you start writing the essay, you want to make sure that the booklet number that's on the front of your exam is also at the top of the essay pages 18 and 19, and that your admissions code are also at the top. I'm assuming they'll give you a space to write that. Um, do not write your name on the page on the writing assignment. So that's probably because the admissions ID code is just a code for your name. So you don't need to write your name as that'll just be repetitive with the admissions ID. And everyone just make sure that you know this before going into the exam. Also, when they give you the Hunter test, they give you the full test. You can start with essay, you can start with reading, you can start with math. So it's a good idea to skim through the entire exam before you start. Okay, I'm going to go back on mute so that Antalya can continue. Um, I know James has to log off in a few minutes, but Antalya, if you could just keep go over this so everyone's in the same page with the rules for the essay. Sure. So just to reiterate what everyone was saying, um, again, you do not have to go in the order that they give you. You are going to get the entire test booklet. Um, James and I talked about this last webinar. Our strategy was to do reading, essay, and then math, uh, because for us, math was a little harder. Um, and sometimes you can get some good ideas from the reading passages for your essay. 
Um, make sure that your only that your essay that you want graded is only written on those lined papers, which in this case were on page 18 and 19. Um, anything else that you write in the outline on a different page will not be graded. Okay, don't detach anything from the test booklet, okay? Um, there's no, no point in that. Um, you don't need a title, you're using a pen or a pencil, and you're gonna make sure that your ID code is written clearly. Um, all of these are instructions that are on the actual test, but just so you guys know, so you don't do anything fishy on the day of. Okay, so no title needed. You do not need to write your name on the assignment. It's on the booklet already. And it does say you need to write your booklet number and admissions ID code so they can identify you. Okay, so just follow the directions even if you're a little stressed, okay? It's okay, you guys will do well. All right. 18 and 19 of what? So the test, you get like a full booklet with the English section first and then the essay section and then the math section. So pages one through 17, I'm assuming are gonna be for English. Um, and then 18 and 19 are like the actual page numbers of the booklet that you have. And those are gonna be the lined, the lined paper for your essay. And then after that, you'll have probably seven to, 15, seven to 12 more pages of math questions. If you're sick on the day of the test, do they let you do a retake? I don't know. I don't think so. I think there's a one. Yeah, you only have one day to take it. How much time do we have on the test? Is it three hours, two hours? Three hours total, and you break Three hours it up. Total. Yeah, I, I, I tutored. Um, no, I proctored the test all five years of being a hunter. Good way to get community service hours. So yeah, uh, I'll talk about that quickly. So the, for the the when you're taking the test, there's not always going to be like an adult proctor. Um, when I was a junior and a senior, they usually have like a younger kid, so a seventh, eighth, or ninth grader. And they'll have an older kid in the room. Some rooms do have a teacher as the proctor, but you can ask questions. Obviously, you can't ask questions directly related to the test. But if you have to use the bathroom, you can raise your hand. If you have a question about where to answer something on the test, you can raise your hand. But you can't be like, hey, what does this question mean? Or how would I do this problem? They can't. The proctors can't answer those types of questions. Where does your phone go, James, during, during? When you walk in, you'll put your bag at the front, your jacket at the front as you take it when it's cold outside. And they have like a, one of those, I think there's no more than 30 kids in each classroom taking the test. And they have those like phone sleeves hanging on the back of the door that you can put your phone to. And you'll write your little name on like a postcard so you know which phone is yours. But yeah, it's a really calming environment. It's not stressful. Don't worry, guys. And there's a bathroom, usually you'll take, if you're taking it, I think there's six different locations there, five, but if you're taking it at the high school or the college, there are always, like Hunter College on 68th, there are always bathrooms nearby the classroom, so you won't lose much time. But try to use the bathroom, please, try to use the bathroom before the test. You don't want to have to worry about having to go number one or number two during the test. Okay, someone's asking, can you bring water, a watch, a phone, or a snack? um no food no you can bring a phone and a watch but they'll take it make sure it's not like a smart watch um if it's just a watch that tell time you can keep it on your wrist but if it has a screen of any sort they'll like they'll look at your wrist and take it and then water you can keep a bottle of water on the floor next to you uh, same with pencil cases if you bring a pencil case you can't have it on the desk with you but like you can put it in the cubby underneath the chairs and just keep the pencils on the desk itself and don't write anything on the pencils. I remember last year when I was proctoring, some kid had like a note in the pen cap and we had to kick him out. So don't do that, guys. That's a very bad way to get kicked out. But I do have to go. Thank you so much for being amazing students. I hope I helped you with any questions. Um, yeah, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Natalia and Miss Francis. Thank you, James. <clears throat> Guys, let's say thank you to James. Okay, I made the chat for everybody. Um, so please thank James for his time and for all of his effort. Good luck, everyone. Have this test. If you stick with color, you'll have 
a great time taking this test. It's honestly, you can, when you, you'll feel so relieved when you finish taking it, but don't rush through it, but you will feel really relieved. It's a good feeling. So make sure to put your best foot forward and keep studying and practice and read a lot. It's good to have a lot of books in your mind before going into the test. It'll help you with your vocab and your reading comp. So make sure you study and get a lot of sleep the night before. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, James. All right. So we are not done yet. Um, I want to go. Those were all examples of descriptive essays. Um, so last week we talked a little bit about the other styles of essays. Um, and so let's see. They, there are the written ones and the um, the visual essays. So we're going to go through the written passage essay first. And we have to read it and then answer the questions, okay? So let's do that. I'm going to annotate kind of like the way I did for the Hunter reading webinar um, so we can kind of get the main idea of this passage, okay? So again, always reading the title. This one is called Capuchin Monkey, all right? So we'll start. Deep in the verdant expanse of the Amazon rainforest resides the agile capuchin monkey. These small creatures of intelligence and adaptability are known for their resourcefulness. Okay, so they're resourceful. They're agile. Okay, life in the forest with remarkable skill and wit. One of the most striking traits of the capuchin monkey is its ability to use tools, a characteristic rare in the animal kingdom. Whether using rocks to crack open hard nuts or sticks to extract tasty insects from tree barks, they showcase an impressive level of problem-solving ability. They're nimble, quick, and always alert, qualities that ensure their survival in a habitat teeming with threats. Okay, so again, if you don't know any words, this is a time to put it in your little hunter vocab notebook, right? verdant or verdant actually i think it's verdant expanse that means it's very green right deep in the verdant expanse of the amazon rainforest so add that one if you don't have it agile um this test booklet is nowhere to be found this is just on the webinar for now it was part of um one of the semester's homeworks okay so just kind of try to pay attention and take notes okay um so what other vocab word do we have here? We have agile. Add that one too if you don't have. But what is the main idea of this paragraph? They're talking about the problem-solving ability of this monkey, how resourceful they are, how skilled and witty, witty they are. They're nimble, quick, and always alert. Okay, and why? Because their habitat is teeming with threats, right? This makes us think they're probably not at the top of the food chain, right? So continuing, using rocks as makeshift hammers, capuchins will meticulously, meticulously, that's a good word if you don't know what it means, will meticulously place nuts on anvil-like surfaces, cracking them open with practice precision. It's a sight that requires patience and skill, but these monkeys are not deterred. So if they're not deterred, they're probably persistent, right? For some persistent monkeys. Deterred means like, um, like they're turned away from it, like they're they're hindered by it. They have even been known to select rocks of varying sizes and hardness depending on the task at hand, exhibiting an understanding of tools and their functions that parallels human cognition. All right, so they're able to pick the rocks um, and pick the different sizes depending on what they're doing. Okay, so they have an understanding of tools and functions that parallels human cognition. Okay, the capuchin's use of tools extends to the search of sustenance in less obvious places. Sustenance is like food, okay? They have been observed, food or things to help them build their habitat. They have been observed using twigs or slender branches to extract insects from the crevices of tree bark or to poke into termite mounds. Okay, in this case, it means food, right? They want insects um, and termites. Each strike of a stick into a crevice is calculated, an exercise of forethought and precision. Again, like I said in the reading section, whenever they're repeating words like this, they really want 
you to hone in on it and consider it as part of the main idea. In this way, a small agile, yet again, a small agile creature not only survives, but thrives, turning challenges into opportunities. Entering high school as a freshman. Okay, so now we're going from the capuchin to um, the first person point of view. Okay. Entering high school as a freshman, I often felt like a capuchin monkey. Okay, this is a simile, right? Because they use the word like. So this is a simile. I often felt like a capuchin monkey thrown into an environment where I had to think quickly and adapt. I had been an exceptional student in middle school, often praised for my academic prowess and artistic skills. But in high school, it seemed like everyone was exceptional. I was no longer the big fish in a small pond, but just one among many talented individuals. Okay, so we see a transition here. What is the main idea? This kid was great in middle school, or right, he says middle school. Yeah, he was great before high school, but then he realized everyone else is also great once he gets to high school. Okay, the hardest obstacle I encountered was my struggle with mathematics. Once a subject I breezed through, it had transformed. Equations had evolved into formulas, numbers into that sorry, numbers into variables. You see here, these are the things that the hunter wants you to do when you're writing your descriptive essays, right? Like a subject transformed, equations evolved into formulas, right? You're using these descriptive words to describe how things change. You're not just saying equations had changed into formulas, right? You're using some higher level vocab. Memorizing formulas and regurgitating facts. The tools I had relied on so far were woefully inadequate in this new landscape. I found myself stumbling the once clear path becoming an intricate maze that I couldn't navigate. Okay, alrighty. Um, so he's describing, or the narrator is describing the struggles that they had once they got to high school, right? Mathematics. The struggle was more real than anything I'd face in middle school. Each failed test felt like a punch to the gut. Okay. The mounting frustration meant even thoughts of giving up would swirl around my mind. But amidst the struggle, I realized that I couldn't continue down the same path expecting different results. This realization was the first step toward change. I enrolled in after-school tutoring, devoted more time to practicing problems, and approached my teachers with questions and doubts. It was a humbling experience to accept the help I so desperately needed. Okay, so here the narrator is talking about what they did to change, right? They looked for help. They went to other people in after-school tutoring, they spent more time doing problems, and they talked to the teachers. Okay, great. He admitted or they admitted that they needed help. My freshman year of high school was a challenging time, but it taught me that adaptability is key. It was the time when I learned not just new academic skills, but also important life skills, perse perseverance, adaptability, and the importance of seeking help when needed. And just like the capuchin monkey, I was becoming adept at navigating my environment, ready to face whatever challenges the forest of high school had in store for me. So here, again, when if they give you a passage like this, read the directions. It says, read each question carefully and think about the answer before writing your response. Draft paper is provided to outline your ideas and writing your responses, be sure to. One, clearly organize your writing and express what you have learned. Accurately and completely answer the questions being asked. Support your responses with examples and details from the passage. Write in complete sentences using correct spelling, grammar, capitalization, and punctuation, which we all know. So then kind of one of the most important things, right? This is different than the other descriptive essays. It says, read the prompts and passage below and answer each question using one paragraph, okay? Um, and the first question that you're gonna answer in this paragraph is, why did the author compare herself to the capuchin monkey? and describe a time you adapted to a new and or difficult circumstances. Some examples would include traveling somewhere new, starting a new activity, and facing a fresh challenge in an old activity. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit last time. Um, so in the chat, you I can only see the chat. Can someone tell me what 
they think the author, why they think the author compared herself to the capuchin monkey. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to switch to a Word document so we can type out an answer to this. Um, and then someone is asking, if you're sarcastic in an essay, but make clear it's sarcasm, would that be rhetoric and give you extra points? I would say don't be sarcastic. Again, like you don't want to confuse anyone. And if you think you have good sarcasm, but the author doesn't understand it, um, you could get yourself into trouble. Okay, so try to avoid that. All right. Is anyone? Okay. I'm waiting for people to type in the chat why they think the author compared herself to the capuchin monkey. Okay. All right. So what was I doing? I was stopping this and I'm going to share my Word document. Give me a second. All right. Okay, hopefully everyone can see this. Can everyone see my screen? Hopefully. Okay, someone is saying yes, good. Okay, that's all I got. That's all I needed. Okay, so let's see. Let's zoom in here. Oh, Jesus. Okay, so the questions were, one, why did the author compare herself to a capuchin monkey? And two was describe a time you adapted to a new and or difficult circumstance. Okay, so thank you to all of you who've given me prompts. Okay, so I love this. Someone said the author compared him or herself to a capuchin monkey to show their adaptability, right? So let's say maybe instead of rephrasing exactly that. I think this is one paragraph that you have to write, and I would aim for six to seven sentences for the entire paragraph. And you're going to answer both questions in that paragraph without separating them. So you can say, the author likens herself to a capuchin monkey um, because they both demonstrate, and now this is when you're going to go back to the passage and remember those words that I highlighted. She gave so many good adjectives describing the capuchin monkey. So you can say, because they both demonstrate um, resourcefulness, a, um, a keen ability to problem solve, and what did someone say? Someone said adaptability, which I really liked. And adaptability. And then you can say, oh, sorry, adaptability. Okay. Um, and then you can say, um, okay, she, then you can say something like, she applies or she, um, I guess like she shows these characteristics as she is becoming accustomed to um, life as a freshman in, not college, in high school. Um, she describes admitting that she needs help and um being able to find the resources necessary to um, tackle mathematics. And then you can say she goes to um, what she did three things, right? She, she enrolls in after school tutoring, um, does more practice problems, and approaches her teachers. Okay, good, enough, right? How many sentences is that? One, two, and then three, kind of a long sentence. Okay, then you can say, now I guess you can start a new line, but it's still in the same paragraph. Also now three to four sentences. And you can say, um, similar to the author, right? Which is a nice transition. Similar to the author, um, I encountered 
encountered a difficult experience when X. Okay, can anyone in the chat give me like a few, maybe like a time they encountered something difficult when they demonstrated adaptability and then I'll run with that example. Okay, grades, when you studied, anything else? Anything else that can show like something a little different from what's in the passage, like anything with sports, moving moving to a new place, okay. Um, joining an advanced after school club, didn't know how to do math. Okay, let's do moving since they talk about, oh, new soccer club, okay, new, okay. Let's pick a um, uh, new, maybe like moving to a new school. We already talked about soccer, unfortunately, but that would work too. Okay, so much of the author, I, um, I, you can even say I faced adversity, right? Or you can say I, um, faced trouble adjusting to a new school after my family picked up all their belong. Now you can be more descriptive, right? So you can say after my family picked up all of our belongings, um, and, uh, brought us from Brooklyn to Queens. Um, and then you can say, um, because um, I am now, or we said not to start with because, right? You can say um, the most difficult or the most difficult part of the adjustment was learning how to take the public bus to school because there was no, I don't know if you can say, like, there was no cheese bus that I was so accustomed to, right? Was so accustomed to. Um, and then you can talk like two more sentences about like maybe like new classmates or something else. Basically, actually, no. You know what? This is not good. You're going to talk about the hard part, right? The most difficult part of the adjustment was um, uh, was meeting new friends. Um, and then you can say, I was normally like, I am normally shy, but like I was, or not I was forced, like I was or I was encouraged to come out of my shell and, you know, interact with, you know, the boys or girls in my class while playing X, like a game or something, right? And the reason why I'm mentioning this is like, you have to show why it was difficult, but you have to describe how you adapted, right? You need to be positive and show how you overcame it, right? You can say you're normally shy, but I made an effort to approach someone when they were playing freeze tag on like in the playground or be nice and specific, right? But you're just answering. I think these are actually a little bit easier than the descriptive essay because you only have one paragraph you know the outline, right? You just have to answer the questions and then make sure that, yes, you are describing the difficult circumstance, but you have to say how you overcame it, right? Let me see what's in the chat here. Okay, someone is saying this is confusing. Yeah, good point. Hunter's expectation. Oh, I guess it is one paragraph, but I started a different line. Oh my gosh, you are right. Thank you. Anna Anna brought this up. Thank you, Anna. Okay. So you're right. It is one paragraph and I already answered it in two. So <laughs> that means you're not going to indent. Okay. Um, and maybe you'll have like a fewer sentences for this author one, right? The author likens herself to a capuchin monkey because they demonstrate resourcefulness, a keen ability to problem solve and adaptability. Um, she demonstrates characteristics um, as she is like, maybe we can make this shorter, right? Um, as she is learning, as she tries to keep up with high school freshman math, 
And then you can do this little semicolon. She enrolls in after school tutoring, does more practice problems and approaches her teachers. And that's good because it shows that you know how to use evidence from the passage. Okay. And then you go on and you continue in this paragraph, no indentations, because as Anna said, um, one paragraph, like in the directions. Okay. Um, let's see. And no, each prompt does not have to be a separate paragraph and should not be because they're asking for one paragraph. So only one. Okay. I led you astray a little bit. Just one. Okay. Um, ooh, Milo, you gave a really good example. Okay. So I like that. Thank you for people who are responding in the chat. Okay, anyway, similar to the author, I faced trouble adjusting to a new school after my family picked up all of her belongings um, and brought us from Brooklyn to Queens. Most difficult part was meeting new friends. I'm normally shy and this is what I did. Okay, and that should be good, right? Let's see how many sentences. One, two, three, four, five. Maybe you can add a, a couple sentences. Um, but basically, the reason why I can't give you a, a solid number is because you have to fill, like, if you have to do a certain amount of lines, right, based on what they give you. I'm not sure if in this new version, they only give you a paragraph's worth of lines, okay? But don't make it extremely long just to fill up the lines, right? Follow what they say, one paragraph. Someone is asking, were we supposed to go to the past meeting or is this optional? This is optional. Um, the webinar last week has a recording, I think, somewhere. So if you wanted to go watch that, you could. All right. So this is what you should do when you come across this. You read the passage, highlight some words that are important, um, get the main idea, and then write first about the author, because that's what it says, and then write about yourself. Okay. I think I have another example of one of these. So we can do that. All right, let me stop. Someone asked, should we always in our essay turn it back to about me? In this case, if they're giving you directions, you have to turn it about me, right? Because it asks about you. In the descriptive essay, you definitely also have to turn it about you, okay? You want to use examples from your own life um, because that's what they hear. Should we? Yeah, you should. Turn it to about back to you, Okay except in the directions. If it doesn't say anything about you, like follow the directions, okay? All right, okay, let's go to another passage. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing the Word document so I can share, um, so I can share the iPad again. Yeah, David, I like what you sent me, that's good. Um, let's see. Oh my gosh, I'm even getting confused with the answer keys. Thanks, Myra or Mira. Um, read the prompts and passage below and answer each question using one paragraph. Francis, are you on here? Okay, when she comes back, we'll ask her, but... Answer each question using one pair. To me, the fact that one is capitalized sounds like it should be one whole paragraph, but we'll verify. Okay, let me see if the other one has different directions. Um, answer each question using, yeah, I think it's only one paragraph total, but we will ask when she returns, okay? All right. Either way, it. You know, in this case, you would just be able to add a little more to each one, but the structure still stays the same, okay? So let's move on to the next passage. Um, Alrighty. So this is about a pocket watch, right? Oh, someone is saying one paragraph per question. Okay, if it's one paragraph per question, then, you know, same concept. Okay, one paragraph per question I'm getting from the students. Okay, one paragraph per question. Um, we'll 
do a better job of that for this passage here. Okay, all right. Uh, this one is called Pocket Watch. Okay. Um, it is small but substantial, fitting neatly into the hollow of my hand. Okay, small, substantial. Its intricate surface is a magnis magnificent display of artistry, a detailed filigree design that traces the outlines of vines and flowers. It is a dance of time captured in a neat round case with tiny Roman numerals arranged in an eternal circle. The petite hour, minute, and second hands glide gracefully over them. At the heart of this antique watch, a mechanical movement beats rhythmically. Okay, a lot of really nice descriptive language. It is the watch's pulse, a whispering tick-tock that serves as a constant reminder of time's ceaseless march. But beyond the aesthetic charm and sentimental value of the pocket watch, it holds another layer of significance to me. It played a role in my life during a time of confusion and transformation, my teenage years. Okay, so now we're starting to see where the pocket watch comes in. I remember vividly standing on the precipice of adulthood the year I turned 16. Adolescence can be as turbulent as it is transformative, a whirlpool of emotions, of questions without answers. I felt caught in a cycle of expectations, not knowing which direction to take, which path was mine. The future loomed, an ominous shadow filled with unknowns. Okay, so uncertain future, a lot of turbulence and chaos for this narrator um, as they're experiencing um, being a teenager and transitioning into adulthood. In that chaos, my grandmother handed me the pocket watch. She held my hands, placing the watch into my trembling palms and told me a story. She spoke of how the watch had been her compass, guiding her through the tumultuous landscape of her own youth. Okay. She explained that each tick of the watch was a moment, a chance to make a choice. The future wasn't a solid, terrifying monolith, add monolith to your vocab, everyone, but rather a collection of these moments and choices. The inscription, she said, was not only about the love between her parents, but it was also about self-love, a reminder to make choices that nurtured her souls, sorry, her soul and her dreams. Okay, so love between parents, love for herself, um and talking about choices. So kind of like that giver essay, right? Just like the hands of the watch, I was in constant motion, ever changing, evolving. I learned to see that change was not to be feared, but embraced. Each tick, each moment brought a new opportunity, a new possibility. I was not set in stone. I was in flux. I could choose who I wanted to be one moment at a time. I began to regard the future not as daunting unknown, but as a landscape of endless possibilities. High school was a tumultuous sea. Again, remember how I was saying if they're repeating words, they're things that you have to pay attention to. I think the author said turbulent and tumultuous at least twice each, right? So they're really trying to get this point across that high school is crazy and chaotic. Okay, high school was a tumultuous sea of complex dance of academia, social norms, expectations, and self-discovery. Someone asked what tumultuous means, <laughs> look it up, but also um, it means like chaotic, like a crazy time, like um, like waves of the sea are described as turbulent, and then tumultuous is kind of like, um, like a, a metaphor in the same way. Um, okay, someone asked, I think it's going to be one paragraph per question. So bear with me as we go through this again. Um, all right. As a teenager, I was lost in the ebb and flow of the tide, right? So a lot of language pertaining to the sea, turbulence, ebb and flow, motion. However, the pocket watch, much like a compass, helped guide me. It helped me to take one moment at a time to breathe, to decide, and evolve, and to evolve. Um, so there we go. It remind me to take one moment at a time to breathe, to decide, and to evolve. Okay. While I sometimes faltered under the pressure of academic expectations, I learned that each moment was opportunity to learn, to grow, to adjust. While I felt overwhelmed by the social complexities of teenage friendships, the watch reminded me that time heals, that moments of conflict and confusion pa would pass, replaced by understanding and maturity. Okay. 
There was no definitive moment where everything changed, where I suddenly transformed from an uncertain teenager into a confident adult. It was a gradual process, a series of moments, just like the ceaseless ticking um, of the pocket watch. The watch didn't alter the flow of time. It altered my perception of it. Okay. The watch is not just an object. It's a part of my story. Okay. All right. Clarification. One paragraph per question. One paragraph each. Okay. Let's clarify this. One paragraph each. Okay. All right. So just follow the directions, right? Because Hunter has been throwing these curve balls, but hopefully the directions on the Hunter test will be more clear. Okay. And so for this purpose, it's going to be one paragraph each. So the questions that it's asking are, the author describes the pocket watch as an important object in his own life. Elaborate on a lesson the author learned from the watch. Okay, so if people in the chat could send me what they think the author learned from the watch, we're going to do the same things. If the directions aren't clear, are you allowed to ask? I think you can ask about directions. That's fine. You're just not allowed to ask about like a particular um, question. Okay. Someone said, so give me, give me what you think um, the lessons are. And I'm going to stop sharing as you do that. And I'm going to go to my, um, my Word document. This should be two paragraphs. Okay. All right. Okay. The author learned that things will pass over no matter how hard okay i like that what's an important object in his own life elaborate on a lesson the author learned from the watch okay all right, so the lesson of the watch is a future choice and you can navigate through the tumultuous. Okay, let's look again. I'm looking again here. Um, okay, I like, we can jot down ideas. I think that's appropriate too because there's multiple things here. Um, it says elaborate on one lesson though. Okay, so some of the things that you guys have said was that the future is a chance to make a choice. Um, not necessarily a scary monolith, right? Um, not necessarily um, terrifying, um, but a collection of moments of choices. Okay, that's one lesson. Um and then I really like this because it's so blatant. It says, it reminded me to take one moment at a time to breathe, to decide, and to evolve. So uh, someone said that. Where did they say? The author learned that it's important to stop and take a breath to calm down every once in a while. Right? And then there's another one where it says, time heals the moments of conflict and confusion would pass. So let's write that. The watch reminded me that time heals, that moments of conflict and confusion would pass, replaced by understanding and maturity. Okay. And someone else was very nicely saying, the lesson of the watch is to value each moment in life and embrace change instead of fear it. Okay, there's a lot of good things. 
Okay, you don't necessarily need to use quotes, but I'm showing you that you need to have evidence for why you're saying something, right? Valuing chain, or sorry, valuing moments, and then embracing change instead of fearing. Okay. All right, so I like this valuing moments, embracing change instead of fearing it. So you're gonna take this, um, and say, let's say we're taking one lesson. So the, um, you can say in considering the watch, the author learns um, to value each moment as it comes um, by taking some time to breathe and like contemplate a decision or contemplate their decision, right? So really valuing the moment. Um, and then and then you can say, um, like the context for this lesson involved, or you can say something about like, she learns this lesson as she thinks about her high school experience and, or like her tumultuous high school experience. Um, and then you can say some, like, if you want to bring up that other lesson too, um, you can say she, I'm trying to think, I think you should use examples now that you have a full paragraph. Um, I wonder if you should use the quote, um, okay, so let's say this. You can say she states, because Hunter really likes their literary essays. So you could say she states, it reminded me to blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, and then you can have like a little analysis of that, that quote. You can say in this way, um, she is able to find a sense of calm, um, in her, or, or during her tumultuous high, tumultuous high school experience. Um, uh, and then you can say, furthermore, use a nice transition word, um, her, furthermore, she learns the lesson, or you can say, she, do, 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 something about embracing the change instead of fearing it. Furthermore, um, she realizes that as she is faced with these changes, um, she can learn or she, she can embrace them instead of fearing them or something like that, right? Like you wanna make sure it sounds good too. Um, and then let's see, and then you could include that quote about the future. Sorry, I'm just trying to do this in real time, right? Um, she realized that she can brace them instead of fearing them. And then actually you don't need a quote. You can say, because the future, or sorry, because um, the watch reminds her that the future is a chance to make a choice, um, thereby painting it in a positive light or something like that, right? 
So that's your pair. That's your first paragraph, something along those lines. I think in some cases, a quote can help um, directly from the passage as long as you analyze it. Sometimes paraphrasing it is fine. That's what we did in this paragraph. And then it says, describe an example of an important object in your own life and what it means to you. Okay. Anyone have examples of things in their lives that's important and that's meaningful to them that you can stick in the chat? Family, I think um, they want an object. Sorry, describe an example of an important object. Ooh, violin, I like violin, that's a good one. Okay, let's do violin. Um, so again, a new paragraph, okay? And you can even relate it back to this other paragraph. You can say, um, my violin is akin to, sorry, akin to the author's watch. I started playing at six years of age. Um, and Antalya, it's already 7.55. So do you want to just give like a summary so that we could yeah. finish? I'll give a summary. Yeah, we don't have to type it. But I started playing at six um, and have come to really enjoy the I don't know, the the calm that it brings over me. And then we talk about this a lot in the descriptive essay, but you can talk about like the texture of the violin, like the the wood grating or like the feeling of the string against my fingers, blah, 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 things like that. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I think we're at the end and we'll have um, everybody say thank you. <laughs> Uh, we really appreciate you coming. Um, best of luck. This is a tough part, but you guys stuck it out. And thank you for your great ideas in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Who wants to see a very cute doggy? Who wants to see a cute doggy? Can you spotlight? Look at yep. this face. Look at this face. Wait, let me see. Look at Munchkin. Munchkin, you look so adorable. You're so photogenic. Look at you. Do you guys wait around for the dog? Yes, you do. Oh my god. Ow! Munchkin. Yikes. Munchkin's very hyper after your webinar. Munchkin, relax. Oh my goodness. Here, guys, check it out. Looky. Look at everybody. Hello. Oh my gosh. Look at that face. Look at that face. Are you guys in love? Munchkin, look at that face. Look at that face. All right, everyone. I'm very proud of you. You did well. We're going to eventually do another webinar, just not uh, immediately. We're going to wait a little bit after break. We're very proud of you. Who can take a cute screenshot of the dog? Look at this dog. Look at this face. Oh my gosh. Ah, stay still. Oh boy. Yikes. Guys, I am trying. Whoa. Munchkin. Look at that face. Oh, so cute. That's it. Munchkin said no more. No more. Munchkin wants to go for a jog after all this essay work. Holy moly. Munchkin, relax. Say bye, everyone. All right, everyone, have fun. Oh my gosh, is that your cat? Wait, can we do a share screen? Wait, can you, wait. Well, can do both, both. My cat really wants some wait, attention. Wait, can we spotlight each other? Hold on, wait, this is a very cute moment. How do we do this? Can you spot, can we share the spotlight? This is I think so you can add a spotlight. Yeah. Wait, oh, okay, we're at, okay, ready? We have a, can someone please take a screenshot of this moment? One oh, second. Yeah, Stay still for the photo. She ah, left. She left. Okay, me. ready, guys? <laughs> this is actually hilarious. Wait, hold on, hold on, guys. Wait, wait, this is too cute. Wait, I'm totally taking a photo on my phone. Hold on. This is so adorable. This is actually one of the cutest things I've ever, like, I can't. This is so cute. You get it because she's going to kill me that I'm holding her. 
I know my dog is not thrilled at the moment either. <laughs> this is so adorable. We have a dog and a cat. Look at that. Your cat is larger than my dog. Do you believe it? Yeah, oh she God, she you made your points. Point. Okay, okay. Relax. <laughs> All these screenshots are so funny. Oh my God. Hilarious. Oh my God, this is so funny. I'm trying <laughs> to get the dog to stay still. Munchkin, stay still. People are taking your photo. The paparazzi. Okay. Ah! Sorry, guys. Dog's not cooperating. All right. Enjoy, everyone. I'm very proud of you. We did well. Have a good night, guys. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Jason. <laughs> Thank you very much. Look at that face. Munchkin, stay still. Some, I think someone's asking in the chat, like, where do you submit the assignments? I don't think for this year of submitting any assignments. Um, you can come to the next webinar if you want. These are completely optional, but they're really... Yeah good and educational and then how many more of these will there be um we're gonna regroup after winter break is that good we'll plan after winter break because hunter has two real released exams i think we'll do poetry we'll figure it out we'll figure it out after winter break thank you everyone yeah. who wants to say bye i'm gonna take you guys off mute ready we are gonna go off mute hold on uh unmute themselves how do you un how do i unmute everyone can you help me unmute everybody, Antalya? You have to ask to unmute everyone. Uh, hold on, guys. I'm unmuting. Uh, I'm not doing it. Sorry, guys. It's not working for me. It's okay. Unmute. It's fine. If you can say thank you, go. Please do so. Thank you. Much. You are not cooperating. Ah. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye. Have a good night. Holy moly, this dog Bye. is like. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have fun. Bye, everyone. All Munchkin right. wants to go for a very long walk. This dog is not having it. Oh. Whoa. Oh, boy. All right, guys. Enjoy. Bye. Make me proud. Bye, everybody. Okay? I'm going to close up, okay? <clears throat> I'm actually going to save some of these photos. This is so funny. This is hilarious. Oh my God, this photo is so funny. This is so funny. Dog and cats, I'm saving this. Oh my god, this is my favorite. Bye, everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you.